Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to talk today about population health analytics, and I'll tell you what that means and uh, give you some examples. So, um, can everyone hear me okay if I wander around? Yes, okay, because I, it's, it's kind of like I can't really see if I'm up there. So, uh, I'll first talk to you about what population health analytics is, and I'm going to present you highlights from two programs of research, and specifically, um, these programs are meant to give you an example of what we do with these data, how we use them. Um, there's also some very interesting findings there, and I tried to pull out some findings from Mississauga Halt and Lynn, um, so we'll talk about those. And then talk about how, how we use these data, what's important to consider moving forward. I know data strategy is really important here um, at the Institute and is go going to be more important moving forward, and um, so I'll talk about some important considerations. And I'm happy to be interrupted at any point if anyone wants to stop and uh, ask me questions. So uh, the goal of what we do in population health analytics is uh, all about supporting health system change and informing health system action. And it's driven through analytics and we focus on three areas, population impact. And what I mean by that is we're always looking at what happens at the population level and I'll give you examples of that. Um, we do look at important priority subpopulations, certainly, but always trying to flip that into context of what that means overall. Um, and sustainability. So as much as possible, we're trying to relate everything that we do and study back to healthcare system utilization and costs. And I'll show you some examples of that. And equity, and that's the idea that uh, are we, are, is everyone in Ontario, where most of our results are from, um, having an equal opportunity from the gains that we're making in health. And uh, we look at a wide range of factors. So one thing you'll note is we're always trying to think of the factors that contribute to the system, both inside and outside the hospital. And we think a lot about the broad determinants of health. Uh, so features of, of the work is that it's all population based, as I mentioned uh, to you, and I'll talk about where the data come from. Uh, because we're trying to look at these broad determinants of health, we use linked health, social, and demographic databases. Um, and increasingly trying to enrich the databases, especially with some of the social uh, databases. Uh, we use various analytic techniques, as by the name um, uh, suggests, but it's not that everything we do is really fancy analytically. Because sometimes you just need really good descriptive uh, regional level data to make changes and sometimes you need really fancy techniques to address challenges with the data or do things like prediction which I'll, I'll show you in a moment so it's not about analytic doesn't mean fancy um, and so I just want to make that point but some of the stuff we do is is a little fancy um, and then the last feature I think that's most important is that we try to make the outputs meaningful at the planning level so I'm going to show you mostly results at the LIN level, uh, we often do uh, analyses at the public health unit level, depending on who we're working with, and we just started doing sub-LIN level analyses. So this week, uh, a lot of the results I'm showing you, we've just generated, I was just looking at them yesterday, at the sub-LIN level. So we try to make the outputs meaningful for the decision makers we're working with, um, and at a level that's useful for planning. So Optimize is the first uh, study I'm going to talk about, and this is a grant that's led by myself and Dr. David Henry, who's uh, now semi-retired in Australia, but still uh, largely contributing. Sorry, should I? If I oh, I'm probably not being good for the camera by moving around it's so okay. much. But, um, just tell me, tell me to go back if you want me to, to stay, change to the, the podium. Um, so he's uh, in Australia, but still uh, heavily contributing with this grant. And you can see by the title, Ontario Population Trends in Improved Mortality uh, Informing Sustainability and Equity of the Healthcare System. So the grant is really centered on mortality trends, and I'll talk about why we're focusing on mortality. But where the two areas that we're really trying to inform with this grant is health system functioning. And when we say health system, we mean both healthcare and public health. And this is really around premature or preventable mortality 
uh, making sure that it is achieved e efficiently and effectively in the population. I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. And the second big focus of the grant is equity and the idea that our health system might be failing certain segments of the population, again, around this idea of premature mortality. Um, and if not failing, there's definitely more to do. So just a, a brief rationale as to why we're focusing on, on mortality. So, uh, you know, there's been an evolution in the way that we evaluate our health system over the last, uh, I'd say, 20 to 30 years. And we have various indicators. And I'm sure you've heard a lot about the, uh, the rationale for various indicators. And our indicators kind of, uh, when we started assessing population health, I mean, mortality was the first thing we'd always look at. And then we sort of moved towards different things like readmission rates and uh, more specific utilization, healthcare utilization factors, which are still really important. Um, but there was somewhat less emphasis on premature or uh, mortality. And there's been a real push back to premature mortality. Um, it's one of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And this is not you know, a global health thing. This is every country in the world is looking at premature mortality. So what is premature mortality? I mean, we can argue for the whole hour about the definitions. The simplest definition, which actually is endorsed by a lot of uh, leading jurisdictions and, and statisticians who do this is, is a death before the age of 75. It's a very simple way to think about it. Um, there's other ways to define it, but for all intents and purposes, we'll just uh, take that definition. And, uh, and the idea behind a death before the age of 75, what does it tell us? Well, obviously it tells us about population health. We know that many deaths can be prevented through effective public health and preventive care. That goes without saying. But the other big part is health system effectiveness. So um, healthcare interventions we know significantly delay premature mortality, particularly for chronic diseases. And so the declines that we've seen in Ontario, um, a huge part of its uh, cardiovascular, reductions in cardiovascular mortality, a lot of that's care, cardiovascular care, improved cardiovascular care and prevention as well. Um, when you see things like 60% decline in cardiovascular mortality in 20 years, you know, that's a very short period of time. And so the health system has a critical role in some of those declines. And it tells us a lot about equity. I'm gonna show you premature mortality rates in our province by different measures of socioeconomic status. And the results are pretty striking, actually. There's a lot of variability. So the other thing that we focus a lot in this grant is about trends and relative positions. So uh, mortality is going down. It's going down in most countries, which is a good thing, though there are uh, groups in our province that are not experiencing this at the same rate. But how are we going down? So this is an, a, an example. It's an older um, slide. I keep forgetting my laser doesn't work on these screens. Um, Ontario and Quebec. So, uh, you know, Quebec's rate of decline for um, this measure of premature mortality is outpacing Ontario. Um, and in fact, in Ontario, BC and Quebec, uh, in Canada, BC and Quebec both do better than us. And compared to peer nations, we're what we call incredibly average. We're not in the top 10 in terms of premature mortality. Canada is not. I know people might think we are. We're doing okay. I, that, that's the best way to say it. We could definitely be doing better. Who's in the top 10? Well, we're not in the top 10. Who is? Oh, um, so Australia, Iceland, uh, Finland, so Scandin Scandin yeah, a lot of Scandinavian countries, but some European countries. Um, Portugal and Italy are rapid improvers, for example. So uh, yeah, I have, a, I have a slide of who are the top 10. I think Iceland might be the top. But uh, Australia, for example, is, is one where they've, had, uh, they've improved much more rapidly than we have. And there's lots of reasons. Yeah. Are you talking about absolute numbers or the rates? Rates, yeah, rates. So we're, in, and Kai Hai just did a huge uh, uh, report comparing 50 nations on premature mortality. It's a, it's a really good report. And yeah, incredibly average. So there's, there's work to be done. And so the, that's where the relative positions um, are important because when we, look, when we look where we stand relatively, we can see are there issues with access or determinants of health and what's happening. The other thing about mortality is that it's very robust and responsive. A lot of people assume if we make changes now, we're not gonna see them for 50 years. That's just not true. If you look at things like the global financial crisis, uh, 
or big shocks to the system, premature mortality responds almost immediately. You see effects. And we've seen this a lot in the US. So it's actually a, a good metric for a lot of things. So the most important thing I want to tell you before I start showing you some of the outputs is how this project's run. And so when we wrote the grant, uh, we really made a point to emphasize that we're not just digging into this really unique database. I'll show you what the database is in a moment. But we're trying to make sure that we're getting feedback from health system decision makers, and then we're holding health system decision makers accountable to what we're finding. So we have um, a scientific committee. This is where we argue about definitions of premature mortality and how we analyze things. It's really important. Uh, and Dr. John Frank. Um, chairs that committee. We have a really great representation. But we have a steering committee uh, chaired by Staney Brown, uh, who many of you uh, know. And this steering committee is made up of uh, health decision makers from across the province. And this includes, you know, Lynn CEOs, representatives, senior uh, representatives from the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, different, you know, HQO, CCO, uh, we have some uh, very specific groups, for, for example, looking at child maternal health, and then uh, MCSS, uh, we have the coroner involved, not listed there. Um, also Chiefs of Ontario, uh, who have requested a very specific um, set of analysis using the database that we've mentioned here. So we meet very often, we prioritize our question based on the needs, and then we come back and have really hard discussions about what we're finding and, and policy directions for next steps. So this is the data set for uh, this particular grant, and there, there are some more specific things, but overall, uh, a, a couple of years ago at the Institute for Clinical Value of Sciences, we brought in the Ontario Registered Death file, which is the official vital statistics data for, um, th that gets reported up to St Statistics Canada, and we got the Ontario version of it. So it's every death that's ever happened in Ontario, every death, uh, over 2.1 million deaths. And the most important thing about this file is that it's linked to a bunch of other databases. So we know for every one of those deaths, all prior healthcare utilization, every healthcare visit, uh, including healthcare costs. And uh, I can't remember, I am not showing you costs today, but we, I, uh, we have a lot of the healthcare utilization. I'll show you that as an example. We also have disease specific registries that we generate from the administrative data, and that could include cohorts that are brought in, so we can know what conditions people died with, how many conditions they have. They are geographically coded, so we have all the census-based profiles for every death, and things like the um, marginalization index, which is a metric of socioeconomic status. And then we have demographic databases, like the CIC data, which is a database of every landed immigrant in Ontario since 1985, so we know who's an immigrant, where they immigrated from, uh, we also have an indigenous identifier through the uh, Indian registry system. This is the analysis that we do uh, in partnership with Chiefs of Ontario, looking at all deaths um, among this population. And then for a subset, we have the Canadian Community Health Survey, which is a routine survey conducted by Statistics Canada, also agreed to have their data linked. We have about 200,000 individuals in Ontario now and uh, there's about 16,000 deaths. So we essentially have a massive cohort study with detailed survey information and 16,000 deaths to do some of the deeper dives for some of the analyses. It doesn't cover the entire population, um, but still helpful. And I'll show you the examples from all these uh, analyses. So I'm first gonna show you sort of what's happening overall, and then basically give you slices of all those different linked databases that we're talking about. And uh, so this is just the overall picture of age standardized mortality for males uh, and females. A couple of things to note that overall mortality is falling in Ontario. The gap for, uh, between men and women is narrowing. And so historically, women have always had lower mortality than men, age adjusted, uh, no matter which way you look at it. That gap is getting smaller. There's lots of reasons why that's happening. Um, and it's nuanced. I'll show you some, some more layers to that picture. So just keep that in mind. Uh, premature mortality, that's death before the age of 75, is also falling in Ontario. We see about 25%, 20, 25% reduction. So mortality is falling. It's a good thing. Um, some things are working. And if you look specifically where the gains are happening, most of the premature mortality gains are happening in the 65 to 74 age group. 
both in absolute and relative terms. And this is actually really important from a health system impact perspective. I think that's one thing that the stakeholder group um, actually kind of brought to our attention that we weren't thinking about. It's because we have so many more, we have so many more older men than we used to have around. And um, this impacts long-term care. This, uh, some of them are single um, because they're outliving their spouses in some cases. Um, and th this wasn't there before. And it, it's some, there's interesting health system impacts for some of these trends that are happening. But major reductions, most of this 65 to 74 is cardiovascular, uh, reductions in cardiovascular death. But there are other reductions across the board. So here's the first layer when we look at geographic variation. As I mentioned, we often slice this many different ways. This is looking at it by Lynn. Um, so the first thing when you look at a graph like this, or a map like this, is to note the variation that we see across the province. So yes, mort premature mortality has fallen, which is really great, but we have a range from 10 to 54 per thousand across one province. And um, we see variation across, so it's not just north, south, east, west, there are some pockets. Um, when you look at finer levels of geography where premature mortality is higher than others and lots of uh, reasons why this may be, but that's just uh, the first layer looking at geography. Just to drill down a little bit more on what this means when you can look at these trends over time, so the idea that trends as well as relative positions are important. So the top graph here is um, Northwest Lynn, which is has one of the higher levels of premature mortality in the province. Northwest, Northeast, and Southeast are actually high. Southeast, um, also one of the higher ones. And this is um, Sagahalton, Lynn. And uh, the solid line in the middle is just the overall Ontario average. So a couple things you can see that the premature mortality rate uh, in Ms. Halton is lower than the average for Ontario. It's going down. You can see the, the trends um, indicate a, a reduction, and that's probably consistent with the 20-25% reduction that we see overall in Ontario. But you contrast that to other areas within our province where the rate of decline, and we, we have the more specific numbers, but uh, the rate of decline actually isn't this, as steep in certain areas. In fact, if you look at women, it almost is flat, if not even slightly increasing. So think about that for a minute. Premature mortality is falling pretty much everywhere in the world, for every group. It's falling in Ontario. We have areas of our province where it actually is staying the same or, or maybe even increasing. That's really significant that, that we have those trends within our province. And there are a lot of factors contributing to that. So, uh, and the other thing is, which is interesting, and I'll show you this, uh, these trends, they're all nuanced, right? So we see differences by sex, we see differences by, by geography. I'm going to show you differences by socioeconomic status as well. So this is a gradient of socioeconomic status using something called the marginalization index, which takes into account various uh, metrics of deprivation. Uh, this is material deprivation. There are, we have these uh, analysis done by various different uh, metrics of socioeconomic status. They do all look quite uh, similar if you use something like income. So we'll use uh, material deprivation here for illustration. And what you can see is that gradient that's persisting, right? This isn't a surprise. We see that the premature mortality rates are highest in the most deprived areas of the province. The absolute difference, which is essentially the space between these lines, is constant pretty much over time. What you can't see on this graph is that the relative differences are actually getting a little bit bigger over time. And that's also a concern. So when we talk to our international uh, scientific advisory group who looks at mortality trends around the world, they'll say things like, you know, in Europe, we see relatively stable absolute and relative inequalities. In the US, both are getting wider, absolute and relative. And Canada's about somewhere in the middle. So what does that mean? That means the gap between the most deprived and least, least deprived is getting relatively bigger over time. So that's a problem, right? We, we need to think about what that means um, in terms of our entire healthcare system and what we're doing to address that. So another example of geographic variation 
and uh, these two lines represent the most deprived and least deprived, so just showing the, the most and the least for simplicity. And uh, these are three different lens, Northwest, Southeast, and Toronto Central for uh, illustration purposes. And what we're seeing is that the premature mortality rate in the most deprived of Ontario has actually gotten to a point where it's lower than the least deprived in the north. And we see the same thing for women. Right? So we're adding in another layer of the analysis here. Premature mortality is going down. We have socioeconomic and geographic variation, and it's actually translating differently across our province. So the, we have a lot of discussions about this at our, at our stakeholder meeting. And one more look at this type of example. Remember early on I mentioned that uh, historically women always have lower premature mortality than men for lots of reasons, um, and it's, the, the gap is narrowing. But actually what we're seeing here is a cross so low-income women are now doing worse than high-income men. And we, it's, it's this gap that happened you know, late 90s, 2000, and it's persisting. Right? It's not, it doesn't seem to be going away. If anything, it's getting a little bit wider. So again, very significant changes based on the historical experience of mortality that we've seen. And there's social determinants at play there. There's probably health care determinants at play there. And there's definitely an equity issue, going back to the three things that we're trying to talk about trying to focus on in this particular graph. And our metric for inequality, this is basically a summary measure of relative index of inequality. Um, and I won't go into, uh, by the time I explain it, 20 minutes will go by, but just to let you know that it's a, it's a measure of the relative, a summary measure of the relative differences, and it's getting bigger over time. So that's that metric, it's a little bit hard to see on the graph, is it getting bigger uh, over time? And it looks like in Ontario, the relative differences between the most well-off and least well-off are indeed getting bigger over time. And they vary across our province. So we have the summary measure of inequality, and again, we're looking at premature mortality, so deaths that we think for one reason or another should not happen. And we have those inequalities that are actually quite big in some regions of our province compared to others. And it's not necessarily where premature mortality is higher or lower. So I put the mississauga halton relative index of inequality measures there, and they're pretty high, actually. They're not, definitely not the lowest, even though overall uh, mississauga halton is doing well in terms of having lower premature mortality rates. The, rel the gap between the most deprived and least deprived is actually bigger in this lens compared to some other lens in the province. We can also drill down into specific areas. So, uh, I mentioned cardiovascular mortality. I haven't showed you um, any of the cardiovascular mortality. We, we have all that and you know, happy to talk after if there's any interest. But this is an example of homicides, which is a very specific cause of death, um, but one that's very complicated because um, from, for, from many perspectives, we believe it's a public health issue and violence actually, all violence is a public health issue. And you can see the gradients, the socioeconomic gradients of victims of homicide. Uh, they're the biggest for any other cause of death we look at in this database. We have all causes of death. This is where the socioeconomic gradients are biggest. I mentioned uh, we have linkages to the immigrant database. And uh, we have lots of analyses here. Uh, there's two striking things when we look at the experience for immigrants versus long-term residents. First. Uh, which is not surprising, and we know this, although it feels like we have to continually reinforce it, our immigrants are healthier. We, we see the healthy immigrant effect. They have lower premature mortality, uh, lower mortality overall. Um, they become less healthy the more time they spend here, um, but about 60% lower rates of premature mortality. And the socioeconomic gradients that we see actually aren't that different between immigrants and non-immigrants. So we still see these gradients within the different um, immigrant categories. But lots of interesting questions that could be uh, dug down uh, a bit dip deeper with this linked data. So I just wanted to shift very quickly to show you a couple results from that survey data. So that survey data, which again is it's not you know one point. 7 million deaths that we use if we look at from 1992, it's a smaller number, 16,000, but for every one of those deaths we have lots of detailed information. This includes things like risk factors, so we can look at both death, causes of death, healthcare utilization by 
risk factors. This is um, body mass index here. Um, and what's most useful, I think, is combining the risk factors with some of the amenable mortality trends that we find. So we can look at deaths that we think are amenable to health systems, and, and there, there are lists for how to do this, um, and we've applied some of those definitions here. And then we can see how that translates according to um, different levels of alcohol use, for example. But there are lots of health behaviors that are captured in these surveys. And so this is really uh, about facilitating the discussion between some of the work we do around health promotion and prevention uh, with some of the health system impacts that we see. Uh, lastly, just talking about the healthcare utilization angle of this work. So for, as I mentioned, for every death, we can go back and look at their utilization and we also look at their conditions. And this is work that I do with Walter Wuchis, which who I know is here. Um, around the idea of multimorbidity. So we can measure, we can go back and measure um, how many people die with chronic conditions. I mean, the main take home point is 65% of people die with five or more chronic conditions. And that's gone up a lot. So the idea of multimorbidity is getting, is more significant. It's actually, you know, it's common now um, and a reality for every death that we're experiencing. So. We're thinking about from the healthcare system perspective, what do we do with this reality, um, knowing that basically everyone towards the end of their life is dealing with uh, many chronic conditions and most of them dealing with five or more chronic conditions. And then the utilization stuff's very interesting. This is just a snapshot of the year prior to death, but we can go back to two years. Uh, well, we've done two years, 180 days and 30 days before death. Uh, but, uh, before death, and this is just in the 2005 to 2013 era, and you can see, you know, 75, almost 75 percent have at least one hospitalization. Uh, almost a quarter have an ICU visit. Vast majority see either a primary care or a specialist, and uh, you know, two million ED visits as well. So you can get a sense of the healthcare burden uh, prior to death, and then we can add the layers on. Does this vary by Lynn? Does this vary by socioeconomic status? Um, is it more pronounced for certain conditions than others? And so on and so forth. So uh, just to loop back uh, at, at what we're trying to do with this project. So uh, again, we're always anchoring this in population health. We want to reinforce the fact that with these premature mortality trends and the linkages of the data, we can identify the variation in population health, focusing on relative positions and trends. But we're also looking at the impact of the work of our healthcare system and on our healthcare system. So what's working well? And I don't want the message to be lost that are, there are many things working well. That's what's contributing to some of the tremendous gains that we're seeing. And what things maybe aren't working well or where do we need to refocus attention? And um, answering the question of equity, I mean, is our healthcare system reaching who it needs to? There's no doubt that disparities exist in our province. And it's interesting actually to even see these disparities at the sub-LIN level that we've just been looking at today. They exist at the LIN level, they exist within the LINs, uh, between the LINs. And in some cases, these disparities look like they're getting worse over time. So it's just a, a moment for us to stop and say before these things are getting worse, what can we do to um, at least not exacerbate this problem and hopefully contribute to minimizing it? So those are the mortality analyses. I'm gonna shift now to the predictive side of some of the work we do. Any questions on that before I move on? Yes. I have a bunch of questions, but uh, maybe if you have Sure, yeah, that's fine. Um, so the next thing I want to just shift to was to talk a little bit about our population risk tools and our prediction models. And this is another level of the work um, that we do with population linked data. And the idea behind these tools is to quantify current and future health system needs um, with the idea that we can inform priorities and the selection of the most impactful interventions or strategies at the population level. So that's what we're doing with these population risk tools, and we have many different types, and I'm going to show you, uh, I guess, three highlights of three uh, that we've developed. 
So the one thing about these tools before I talk about them, um, and, and many people use predictive models and many people embed them, uh, embed these models in data that we feel is m more widely accessible. And there's a reason for that. It's because we want people to actually use them. <laughs> Instead of us just building the models that we can run with our rich databases that we have access to, and, and we certainly have those models, and I have colleagues that focus specifically on those types of models. Instead, we're building these models so that um, people in other organizations or health system planners or decision makers actually use them and it starts, uh, it, it's much more effective in terms of influencing decision making when that's the case. So we make them available um, to run on the CCHS surveys. So all of the models I'm presenting to you can run on the surveys and um, they could be used in a variety of different ways. So uh, one of the most common ways is to understand distribution of risk in the population. And I'll show you an example of this in, in Saga Halton. Uh, when we developed them, our, our focus was really on prevention planning and thinking about preventing mostly chronic diseases, although now we have models for healthcare utilization and uh, more broadly, but they are also useful for resource planning. Um, we, we hope that they're useful for decision making. I think they've definitely done that and I'll show you some examples. And the last thing that's most important, and this kind of goes back to my first point, is that they're tailored and meaningful for specific regions. So because the survey data are available in meaningful health regions, they can run on those levels um, and they're more useful for sort of local decision making. So the first one that was developed uh, a while ago, um, I guess in 2010 or 29, 2009, uh, was the Diabetes Population Risk Tool. Uh, and it's been updated. So this is a tool that where we linked the CCHS, that linkage I talked about, and we have a diabetes registry. And through that linkage, we have this cohort, and we develop models that basically predict number of new cases of diabetes in the region. And I'll show you the results from Saga Halton. And uh, again, you can see here an example for Ontario where we predicted 2013 to 2023. You can do various time points. Um, you can look at magnitude and scale of burden, um, and we train people to use these tools and these data. The other uh, recent addition to these types of tools, it's not just number of new cases, which is really important, but we've added in costs. So we took every diabetes case in Ontario and matched them heavily uh, using propensity matching and, and hard matching to people that I guess uh, one way to think about it is they look exactly the same, the only difference is that they don't have diabetes, and calculate their individual level health care costs, sum them up, and that allows us to get an attributable cost estimate. So not only can we predict number of cases, but we can predict the cost to the healthcare system. Again, really important for decision making. And this is an example where we have a prediction, a 10 year prediction. This was done on the 2011-12 data, and then we can talk about where in billions the cost would show up in the healthcare system according to sectors, hospitalization, physician <coughs> visits, prescriptions, um, et cetera. Uh, this is an example of predicted uh, diabetes burden in particular regions, so we can look at certain areas of the province where diabetes risk is higher or lower, again from a provincial perspective useful for planning. Um, and this is an example of looking at distribution of risk in the population. So this is that 10 year diabetes risk in the Mississauga Halton Lynn as predicted by the tool. And again, the tool has been validated. So we have lots of really robust metrics to show that observed is predicted and the risk is accurate. And uh, we validated actually in multiple provinces. Um, but you know, not as not, not surprising to most people that um, study diabetes or work in the area of diabetes that obesity is the main risk factor. So body mass index at the bottom, the, the highest risk is among the people with the highest uh, BMI. But this is risk, this is probabilities. What happens when you layer on the distribution in the population? So the number of new cases of diabetes, actually the majority are happening in this moderate risk group. <laughs> so what's happening here? So What's happening is that, yes, these people are at high at risk, but there's smaller numbers of them. And when you do these prediction models and run them on local data, you can actually start doing these numbers and translating them out and seeing what happens. And 
for the most part, our diabetes prevention strategies were focused here, right? Focused on those that are the highest risk, the highest subgroup within the highest risk for the most part. And actually, the Auditor General called us out on this in 2012, where we spent $800 million on a diabetes prevention, uh, or, or diabetes strategy, including millions of dollars for prevention. We were targeting probably about, you know, less than 10,000 people, the highest risk of the highest risk. And actually, diabetes risk didn't go down after all those investments. It even went up a little bit. And one of the reasons why is because we're making gains here, possibly, with the very targeted high-risk prevention strategies, but we're missing how risk is distributed in the population. So for diabetes, not the case for all diseases, um, a population-based strategy that encourages um, more, has wider reach, maybe more moderate levels of intervention, uh, is actually critical for curbing diabetes incidence. So these are the types of things that you can do with these uh, prediction models. These are examples of questions that we get from a variety of decision makers we work with, and you can see that some of them are very specific to diabetes prevention program. How many people do we need to target if we have a program that we think does this? But some of it is just burden. You know, how many dialysis units will we need in the next five years? And how can we demonstrate reallocating funding? So this is something that we've worked a lot with because we have the cost estimates um, on how we can do the, the trade-offs. The next uh, population risk tool that I want to talk about is called MPORT, which again predicts mortality. So this is led um, by my colleague in Ottawa, Doug Manuel, who I work with on the population risk tools. And he's using these tools in a, a slightly different way here. So obviously we can look at mortality trends and all the things I showed you earlier, looking at mortality across lanes and, and predicting the future. But here he's using it to demonstrate the impact of health behaviors and measuring the burden of health behaviors. And because these tools can run lo locally, we now have health units um, interested in running these uh, locally to find out, well, wh where's the burden uh, mortality burden on risk factors, and that's helping prioritize prevention and uh, planning in their regions. And the last one that just got, uh, just published this in medical care is the uh, healthcare uh, HRU port, high resource user population risk tool. So this is the skewed distribution of healthcare spending in Ontario, and um, again, not a surprise, you've heard of the top 5%. Um, the idea that 5% of the population accounts for over two-thirds of healthcare spending and lots of attention <laughs> focusing on the top 5%. So we built a prediction model that actually helps predict who will be a high-cost user using these linked data. And we can look at how this is distributed across geographic regions, demographic groups, and really important looking at back to some of the determinants which are a little more upstream um, to high resource utilization. So this is an example, just project, uh, projecting out to 2019, how many Ontarians will become a high resource user, how much it's going to cost the healthcare system, and where those costs go, for example, the top 1% versus 2 to 5%, <coughs> where, how that looks across LIN. So about one to three transitions will occur in these LINs. Um, this is num numbers, right? So we, we look always at risk and numbers. Um, and so some of it's driven by population denominators, but you can also look at risk. Uh, you can see Mississauga Halton, uh, which is about middle of the pack. Um, so an idea of planning, and you can look at the number of high resource users in a particular region. You can look at it by different characteristics. So. Uh, one thing that we often see with high resource users is that they're disproportionately represented by those in the lowest income group or the, the highest marginalization uh, index, depending on how you look at it. So you can actually look at the disproportional representation and think about this if you're trying to plan for mitigation strategy, strategies for high cost users, um, thinking that it's, there's a social, uh, socioeconomic element to it. You can look at health behaviors, so things like smoking, and obviously we see a, a high number of high resource users and people that have smoked, but the biggest, again, burden happening in non-smokers, well, that's a, simply a function because our smoking prevalence is 
under 20%, which is a good thing. It, it doesn't mean we ignore them, but it means we can't ignore the fact that the majority of the population, the majority of high resource users will not be smoking. So we can't think of a strategy that's only smoking based or smoking focused if we're trying to think of prevention. And this is again, Saga Halton specific. I showed you those uh, socioeconomic gradients for overall for Ontario. It looks a little bit different in Mississauga Halton, but still largest proportion represented in the bottom uh, two quintiles of income. And then you can look back by uh, risk factors, diseases, etc. So lots of different ways uh, to look at these, um, these predictions. So uh, where are we going moving forward with these, uh, this work? So we've actually uh, developed a lot of training tools um, as well as a model about how we work with decision makers interested in using the population risk tools. We've trained a lot of people to use them in two provinces, in Manitoba and Ontario. Um, my colleague I mentioned, Doug Manuel, is really moving the web interface of this forward. So we train people to use them who love data, use data, used to working with data, but uh, eventually looking to develop a web interface so anyone can do these calculations. Um, and then we have a variety of methodological, if people are interested, um, challenges with these predictive models that we're uh, incorporating in. One thing I will say uh, about the list over there is, you know, we do these simple predictions. These are sort of baseline prediction models. We do feed into more complex multi-simulation models, which basically you know, involve simulating the population. They're, they're a higher level uh, of simulation. They answer different questions, but they're not mutually exclusive. These prediction models feed into those, those bigger models or cost-effectiveness models, for example. Um, and so we can, I can be happy to talk about those as we move forward. So I'll just end off on a couple data considerations. Uh, the first one is measurement. So the one um, point hopefully that came across is that data and the population-based data that we work with come from multiple sources. So uh, I think, you know, there's still this impression that we're still only working with health administrative data. And actually none of the things I showed you are only health administrative by themselves. We're now supplementing these data with multiple different types of data sources. And some, sometimes we're using it to validate Sometimes we're looking at the same index through multiple lenses. So for example, I've, I've showed income and socioeconomic status various times. Uh, we have ecological measures, we have individual measures in the survey, we have income education. So lots of uh, measurement uh, considerations. Um, and we're really trying hard to quantify and m measure the impact of some of the data issues that we have. And I'll, I'll tell you what I, I mean by that in a moment. And that's it. So my last uh, points here, just to recap at, uh, back to the beginning and what I was hoping to share. Um, first, the idea of population health analytics and what we're trying to do with population health analytics. The idea of working with population-based data, linking multiple data sources so that we can better reflect the determinants of health using various analytic techniques and tools. So I showed you some descriptive stuff, showed you some mapping, some predictive modeling uh, uh, to give you an idea of the different analytic tools. And the idea that all the outputs that we're trying to generate should be uh, meaningful at the planning level. And this is where we have a lot of input on what, how that looks. Uh, the two programs that I talked about today are examples with uh, an explicit health system focus. So we, we very much value the input
from decision makers using the data uh, and work very closely. And the last thing to talk about for data considerations, uh, mostly that we're integrating across new types of data, validating increasingly with different types of data, including EMR, and trying to uh, better quantify measurement issues as they exist. Yeah, so I don't do it, thank, <laughs> thankfully. Uh, these data sets are all housed at the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences. And um, within the infrastructure at ISIS, there's an encrypted health card number. Um, so everybody, every individual in the data set has a health card number. It gets encrypted, uh, something that's called a unique identifier, an ICANN. And that allows the crosstalk between all the databases. So essentially, all the databases that come in Get, in, get that encrypted unique identifier and that allows the linkages across all the databases. And it's very restricted who can do this, so when I say I can't do it, there's only um, one person in the, or I guess two, uh, as a backup, uh, uh, in the organization that has the authority to take, strip off the health card number, put this encrypted number, and then once the encrypted number is on there, then then we can link across, and it's very, it's actually very easy at that point because it's just a deterministic linkage. But are all the data sets linked to the health card number? So, for example, the patient status. Yes. Income, all of that is linked to. That yes, data. that's right. So what happened is once we when we brought the immigration data in, we did a linkage uh, probabilistically to get their health card number attached to the database. So every time a data set's brought in the health card number is either on it or it's linked to it one way or another. Yeah. yeah. Well, we will, anyone that com, comes in through Citizen Immigration Canada is in that database. Uh, we don't get, we don't get uh, real time yeah. estimates of it. Yeah. So it, we get like bulk um, <laughs> estimates of it and then, then it's linked at that point. But we do have, you know, yeah, refugees, everything, when, when we get the data in, yeah. Yeah, so it's not real time. Okay. We are very far from uh, being real time yet. So, okay, so to segue from that, um, you had shown us data to show that uh, the comparator between new immigrants and long-term residents. Mm -hmm. How many years does it take to move from one section to another? Mm -hmm. So the reason why we say long-term residents is because we only have the CIC data from 1985. So anyone that's... Um, landed before 1985 or born in Canada is considered a long-term resident. Because we, there may, be, may have been people that immigrated prior to 1985, like my parents, for example, they would be considered long-term residents because we don't know their immigration status. So we only know immigrants since 1985. So it's most, I mean, I think we capture a very relevant group. So that's just a data limitation. But within the database, you can limit it to, if you're only interested in, say, immigrants for five, within the last five years, you can do that. Like, that's not a problem. Because we have the landing date. We don't have landing dates before 1985. Yeah. I'm sorry, Julie, you had a question? Hi, Jill. <laughs> you talked about um, all the different ports. So yes. Um, the health units have D port. I wondered if you could speak to where the M port and the yeah. HRU port is. Yeah. Heard about, Absolutely. Yeah. So um, Julie and Peel has, have been an incredible champion of using these population risk tools. And actually, what I love is that I think you guys get more questions about Deport than I do because <laughs> they 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 start learn you know the health units start asking you the questions. Um, so Mport, we're just in the process of making them available at the health unit uh, level data. Doug, um, so we, we're t trying to take a different approach. Doug is trying to push the more web version and so that the back end is all calculated. The way Dport, as you know, uh, works right now is we actually train people to run it on statistical software. They run macros, they 
you know, it's very, so it has to be a fairly savvy user to be able to run it. Where uh, Doug's now try, trying to work on this version where the back end would all be calculated um, and web face. So that's in process. HRU port, um, we just published it uh, as, as in a week ago, but the code's ready and we have it available on that web interface as well. But we have very similar um, programs as we do for Dport. So anyone that's interested in using it, we can send them the code and they could use it. So that one could be implemented actually fairly quickly. Yeah, Thank thanks so much. I think this is actually a really great opportunity to understand the translation of the research to practice. And so I'm wondering, Julie, how do you guys use Dport? Uh, we use it, so we do a lot of health status reporting and in fact we'll be, we're working on a, a new comprehensive health status report to inform our next strategic plan. So we would use Dport to kind of show where those trends of diabetes are going to go and um, bring in some of the other risk factor pieces that are in that tool. So it's, it's very helpful. And then the cost piece is also uh, hugely useful when we're trying to describe burden, potential burden, where should we be focusing. Yeah. And I know in Peel, for example, um, I went with David Mowat, who was a medical officer of health at the time, to city council to present some of the deport results because, again, we were uh, trying to talk about the shift to the built environment and the importance of that and what's happening and why, why it's important from a diabetes perspective cost. So that's an example. But other health units as well, I think when, when they do surveillance now, I mean, typically when you surveillance, you report, say, a number of cases of diabetes in X region. Now they're not reporting the current and the future, so which is helpful. Yeah. How much delays in the data set that you get? Like, is it like right now, 2017? Do you have the latest data from 2014? Yeah, good question. They're all different. So uh, the hospitalization data is fairly, uh, like I would say, about a year behind, um, and the OHIP data is more frequent. The vital stats data is two years minimum lag, and that's because. Um, all, all the cause of death and then they verify and coroner and then it has to get linked. So some of them, some of the death data that I showed you here are two and three years behind. That's about as fast as we can get. But there, it's a good question because they're all different. Yeah. It's a challenge. Yeah. Yeah, who do I email to get access? You? Directly <laughs> <laughs> relevant to my current work. Yeah, yeah. You can email me. I mean, the, some data sets have different access than others. I mean, one thing I'll say is that the um, at ISIS, there's a process called Data and Analytics Services, DAS, and it's a way that you can VPN in uh, very specific data. Not all data can be uh, characterized that way, but yet yeah, you can email me and I can let you know. I mean, one thing, uh, there are very strict privacy and security uh, things around these data. So there's a lot of hoops, <laughs> as uh, Morgan knows, <laughs> forms and stuff to fill out, but there's, there's definitely ways, and the access has improved, I would say, dramatically since my 15 years of being at ISIS, so there's ways, yeah. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I look forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sounds good, sounds good. Questions? <laughs> Okay. Great. Well, Great. thanks so much Thank so for much having for me. Yeah. No problem. Mm -hmm.